we invite the, uh, the presenters now to take over. Uh, our first presenter is Dr. Bala Subramaniam, assistant professor at Xavier University. And he's going to be presenting research on does the customer complain or appreciate? Nudging them to feel grateful. Go ahead, Dr. Bala. Good morning. Hope I'm audible. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I have shared the slide. <clears throat> Before uh, getting to the topic, let me explain the context. So generally in, uh, in our life, uh, wherever or whatever it is, the focus is more on the negativity, complaint. We tend to complain more than uh, feel grateful or feel happy. So if there is anything to complain, we leave no stone unturned in reaching to someone or the authority and make a complaint. But we hardly have time or bother to feel grateful or happy. Again, this statement is based on the research. So focusing on the positive things or counting the blessing rather than the cursing will have a lot of personal benefit. It increases the well-being. It strengthens the relationship with others, particularly gratitude. So the gratitude research has been done in many domains, though it's from psychology. It has been extended to social psychology, uh, sports domain, married couples, children. In all the domain, it has its own consequences. Among the married couple, it strengthened the relationship. Among the school and college children, uh, feeling grateful, integrated them with a bigger community. Among the sports people, uh, it increased the sports well-being. Recently, gratitude studies has been extended to management domain as well as marketing. The last four, five years, we can see a lot of research has been done in the gratitude research in marketing. So this study is about given choice. When if the choice is given, or in general, or does the customer complain or compliment? Nudging them to feel grateful. Whether we, is it possible to make them grateful? That is the focus of this study. So this is the flow of my presentation. After introducing the topic, I briefly review the literature related to gratitude in marketing. Then I state my objective, followed by I'm narrating the methodology adopted. I share the finding, followed by discussion and conclusion. So customer feedback is defined as customer communication concerning goods and services. So whatever the feedback about the purchased goods and services, that is called customer feedback. So the feedback can be neutral, negative as well as positive. But most likely the research says that customer complaints a lot. The review of online, uh, research and online review suggests that customer complaints a lot. A dissatisfied customer tend to leave a negative review than a satisfied customer to give a positive review. So even we as a customer must have done that. Whenever we are not happy with some service, we immediately try to reach out to them and um, highlight our dissatisfaction than when we are satisfied or happy about their service. So my uh, personally I had a gut feeling that maybe the companies or the organization giving over emphasis for collecting the negative feedback. The way we approach them, it seems that they are nudging them to complain rather than elicit the positive feedback. That was my uh, contention, uh, my assumption. Studies have also acknowledged that we have to focus on, we have to change the focus from customer complaining to positive feedback. Because whenever uh, we make the customer feel delighted, whenever we make the customer happy, that moment should be captured. That has its own advantage. Customer feel happy about the brand, customer feel positive about the brand. The employees also will be very happy on getting the uh, customer's positive feedback. Otherwise, when, whenever the customer complained a lot, the Frontline employee, they are the uh, receivers end. They are getting, they are receiving whatever the brand does for the customer. So it has a negative consequences for the frontline employee in terms of stress. But when the customer share the delighted moments, whenever the customer share the positive aspect, 
again it has a positive impact on the employees particularly the frontline employees so this study intend to examine the role of customer gratitude in eliciting positive feedback from the customer gratitude is labeled as moral virtue moral virtue or moral emotion means uh, presence or absence of gratitude shows the morality of a person so ungratefulness uh, or ingratitude is condemned in all the cultures we, we, we don't value the ingratitude we always value the gratitude <clears throat> so the role of gratitude in marketing context though uh, there are more studies uh, relating with the customer relationship management relation with the customer feedback there are less research has been done let me explain the definition of gratitude it is an attitude of appreciating the life as a gift and recognizing the importance of expressing that appreciation so we should have a appreciation that life is a gift and we should also express the same with others so gratitude has personal consequences as well as interpersonal consequences personally when i appreciate that life is a gift i feel good i am more positive it i my positive emotions are elevated socially when i acknowledge with the help i received my fellow colleagues or friends relation it strengthens the relationship thank you very much la one of the day uh, on the other day you have done a help that matters a lot when you specifically highlight the help and acknowledge that help the relationship between you and the helper increases the main focus of customer relationship management is maintaining developing high quality relationship with the customer and wherever there is a direct relationship one to one relationship or one to many relationship gratitude has a vital role to play because there is an exchange involved so the company or the organization is giving something to the customer the customer can complain or they can also feel grateful when the customer feel grateful it has its own consequences to the organization so the customer gratitude consists of affective component that is feeling grateful as well as behavioral component that is <coughs> reciprocation behavior so behaviorally they can reciprocate by spreading positive word of mouth or they may buy the product again and again so relationship marketing and service quality are the major sources of gratitude customer gratitude and in return to that customer they refer more customers for the good service they received when whenever the company invest in relationship marketing or whenever the organization provide better service that elicits the gratitude among the customer so the customer perceive the brand more positively and they also spread the positive word of mouth about the brand it improve the relationship building relationship between the customer as well as the organization or the brand the customer loyalty enhances the customer has overall satisfaction with the particular brand particularly the affective commitment mediate the relationship between gratitude and customer word of mouth intention affective commitment in the sense emotionally they are committed to a particular brand for the receive uh, for the service they received so they remain grateful to that particular brand and they express their gratitude through spreading positive word of mouth as well as in behavioral by expressing their loyalty to that particular brand customer has different experience in shopping for example <clears throat> you are going to a shop you are purchasing something the sales attendant may have must have helped you in getting a product or searching a product so for that definitely we acknowledge that help we feel grateful to that similarly negative experience also we have the long queue that we experience in big bazaar or reliance and any mall this one negative incident will destroy all the positive things that happened in the our you know our shopping experience so while customer leave they leave with the mixed emotions yeah you have good service but there was a long queue there was no variety or there are more variety so the customer leave the company or uh, store with the mixed emotion at that time capitalizing the positive emotion will benefit the organization that is the focus of my study at that time if you ask where we can improve the customer most likely highlight the negative experience only 
the customer most likely trace the negative memories and highlight the negative aspect and though it will improve the service of the brand that will also result in demotivation of the for the employee because you are failing to correct the positive aspect that you have done so the objective of the study is to find how does the organization approach the customer for feedback first we have to understand whether the customer organizations are approaching the customer for feedback positively or negatively then whether the customer can be nudged to give positive feedback these are the two objective i had in my mind before starting this study so i had uh, two study the first study is based on the company websites i went through the company's website and i examined how they collecting the feedback from the customer so mainly we are interested to know whether the websites are encouraging uh, to give neutral feedback uh, or negative feedback or positive feedback so since we don't know what kind of feedback the company have received i want to know the company must have uh, the organization may be approaching negatively or positively but unless we know the content of the feedback we cannot conclude so i went and surveyed the customer directly from the retail store i adopted the same three method i am explaining one by one so the study one is based on the second data of the websites major websites <clears throat> we entered to know the online portal of the organization how they are approaching the customer for their feedback so we went through the websites of different organization we have analyzed 30 organizations in the website 30 numbers that that include all the domain motor industry service Uh, hotel restaurant app based organization and we particularly uh, uh, browse to the customer contact site or uh, contact us uh, link and to know how they are approaching the customer for the feedback so this this we know very well app based organization whether ola or swiggy they are giving the rating system 1 to 5 so where 1 to 3 is uh, less than 3 is uh, dissatisfaction about 3 is definitely a satisfied and good service some organization have that we welcome feedback and suggestion have an issue complaint grievances pitches these are the major uh, way organizations are collecting feedback in their website so some have the combination of both that is they give the mail id plus the statement is very clear we welcome feedback suggestion do you have any queries do you have any issue do you have any complaint reaches among the 30 website around 25 website have this this statement so our conclusion is that if we approach with this statement most likely customer will give suggestion again when you give suggestion you are highlighting the negative aspect which is not there in the uh, company this is uh, our assumption so but we don't know what kind of feedback the customer gave so we cannot conclude to address this lacune we went to the second study moreover not all the customer will contact the website for feedback some may give the feedback some may ignore so that possibility is also there so to address this issue we went for the second study uh, on some selected retail store that has a pan india presence we approached that retail store uh, the store was located in madurai so after getting permission from the manager whichever the customer comes out of the store we approach them both offline and online data were collected we collected three type of survey independently the first survey is neutral we asked the uh, customer coming out of the store please share your feedback that's all second survey is negatively worded tell us how the store can improve their service third way is positively worded tell us where we excelled in our service or tell us something that made you feel grateful to us so these three survey were independent independently carried out at the same time to different group of customer okay there was no overlapping of customers all uh, survey were carried out independently at the same time to different group of customers so we worded neutrally negatively as well as positively so the positively worded survey is called nudging we try to nudge them to feel uh, to give positive feedback these are the result so the survey has opened at one they gave the uh, feedback in a statement your store was good 
there was uh, no variety uh, it is difficult to get some products that way they gave the uh, statement we have coded we have coded the statement so number of sample is 30 per survey 30 samples share your feedback open uh, open little question for that we collected 30 samples so among the 30 there are 25 positive feedback four are negative one other response other in the sense i have no time i cannot comment like that so the comments were coded if it is positive feedback i coded as one if it is negative feedback i coded as two if there is other responses i coded as zero then i added the number and made a table for the negatively worded, for nudge to be negative, give negative comment. Tell us how and where we have to improve. As expected, we got more negative feedback, 19. 19 number of negative feedback. Still, seven positive feedback came. Four other responses. The third survey, that is nudging them to feel great. Tell us about something where we can improve the survey or how our store made you grateful. And we got no negative feedback, all, all 30. All. 30. Everyone recollected the positive things about the store and they give the uh, comment. So we did the ANOVA to find the uh, difference and it is significantly different. The groups are significantly different and the mean value is higher for the nudging group. So the result of the study one shows that most of the organizations ask for feedback, suggestion and grievances we speculate that this will most likely elicit a neutral feedback or negative feedback more likely than the positive feedback. So as per our survey, we can also, is it also possible to get a positive feedback from the customer? Getting positive feedback is always good for the organization. They can know their strength, where they are doing well. It will improve their employees' motivation as well. Some of the employees go beyond their role in serving the customer. So whenever that is highlighted, the employees feel good. Plus, this can also be used as a performance appraisal tool for the organization. So we draw uh, support from the affective network theory, which shows that our memories are stored in the brain with the associated emotion as well. Whenever you are going for a picnic, the picnic is stored in the mind along with a happy emotion. So when you are asked to recollect the picnic, you are also feeling positive. You are eliciting a positive emotion in the individual. And you are exhibiting positive behavior, you are using positive words. So similarly, when the customers are asked to recollect the appreciated service or recollect the grateful services, uh, it elicits the grateful emotion in the, uh, among the customer. So they become grateful they elicit the gratitude related behavior like positive word of mouth. When the customer particularly leave the store, they, and when, when you're asking the customer to feel grateful at the time of leaving the store, they go with the positive memories or grateful memories. So that is one of the uh, major contribution of this study. So conclusion is that organ, organization can also uh, shift their focus from negative feedback to positive feedback because no product or service per se has negative negativity. It is also depends upon the customer's inference. So it is possible to elicit positive feedback and it makes a customer uh, grateful, but the organizations are failing to capture the same. So the manager implication, yes, this is the uh, manager implication. The limitation of the study is that uh, the studies restricted to only one city. Earlier, earlier we planned two, two to three cities, but exactly the because of the third wave, we couldn't go ahead with the other cities. Plus a lesser number of uh, size, as well as we have not done the demographic wise, we didn't do the analysis. Whether women customers tend to feel more grateful or men or younger customer feel tend to be more grateful than the men, that uh, we uh, failed to do that. That is one of the interesting uh, directions for future research. In addition to that, why the customers are feeling grateful? For example, we have that uh, survey in that they have mentioned uh, some of the employees, they went beyond their role. So I feel grateful. Products are arranged neatly. So I'm appreciating that. That way they highlighted that. So whether the customer gratitude is for the tangible thing 
are intangible it is is it for the employee or is it for the store appearance that also we can do the analysis by going through the content another direction for research is that those customer who left with the gratitude are they coming back again are they tend to purchase more that could also be a uh, direction for future research uh, that's all thank you very much for the given opportunity i'm happy to answer your question if i can hello can you hear me yeah so uh, that was an interesting presentation uh, bala thank you sir now i am going to kind of frame my observations more as questions for you to see how one can push this particular piece of research uh, into the future uh, so your design for the study two actually is very very nice because you have created a control group and uh, two treatment groups and uh, compared to the neutral uh, ask for feedback the how can we improve automatically leads to a large fall in the number of positive responses you know from 25 to 7 uh, so that is actually the most interesting part uh, the fact that on when you are asking for positive you are getting a positive one is is perhaps uh, not as interesting per se but between neutral and asking to improve that the drop can be so substantial uh, because when you are asking for improving how we can improve you are actually framing it in a positive way you are not actually saying that you know what did you dislike that would be a really negative way of framing for uh, framing the uh, feedback question that what did you not like or what would you like to complain about that's a really negative ask of a feedback when one asks for feedback saying how we can improve uh, that's that i would kind of argue to you is framing the ask for a feedback in a way that makes it positive even though one is asking for improvements which will recall more negative stuff right uh, so that's one observation that i have that if for example you ask for complaint uh, would it be uh, 030 right um, because that would be a pure negative ask so here uh then it makes it even more interesting because then you are saying that even framing a feedback in a positive way leads to a difference in the neutral versus a positive versus negative feedback and that's an interesting finding in and of itself the second observation is that as you say towards the end of your uh, uh, of your talk that why is it that people feel grateful and why is it that people feel negative Uh, so this goes back and is a corollary of my first observation that when you are asking the feedback in a particular way even though you are asking for improvement versus asking for uh where did we not serve you or what are your complaints or what were you unhappy about so th those are different nuances that one would like to capture because arguably if i'm asking for improvements that makes me as a customer feel differently think differently versus when i am asking for what are your complaints on this visit or uh, versus i am asking for what did you like and what did we excel at right uh, so that's uh, if one is able to do that and then construct uh, a study that allows us to check the mechanism by which people arrive at this decision right um so in terms of the translation from your affective to behavioral i think that's another dimension because you said gratitude has two dimensions right affective and behavioral and ultimately as a company i am interested in seeing how one can translate affective gratitude into behavior that helps me loyalty uh, so what i am capturing over here is the affective part uh it would be really interesting to see if for example 
these uh, 30 people who are saying, you know, I'm positive. <laughs> when you asked what we, what did we excel about, uh, so, and all of them gave positive responses. So uh, in these 30 people, how many actually then came back and bought products at this store? Similarly, in the uh, seven people who were in the improvement category, how many people came back and asked and bought? In the seven, in the 19 people who were negative, when we asked for improvement, how many people came and bought? Right. So then I'm able to capture the beha behavioral dimension of the gratitude also. Of course, one would need to have some more information, which I hope that you have collected. But if you were to do a study three, those should definitely be there. Uh, one dimension that should be there is many of these people, for example, would be regular shoppers at this store. And some people may be not so regular shoppers at this store. So the behavior of the regular shoppers would arguably be different from the behavior of the non-regular shoppers. Uh, so I would want to have a so-called control variable that allows me to screen out the bias that might be brought into the result if uh, without if I do not control for the fact that some of the shoppers are absolutely regulars, they come there every week or every two weeks, and others come there once in three months or once in six months. So some uh, a question which actually captures that particular description of the shopper to me is an important addition to make the study more robust. The next comment that I would I would say is that uh, in the gratitude literature, uh, and this goes back to the point that I made about trying to capture the behavior and the affect dimension. In the gratitude literature, it is not really clear as to how gratitude manifests itself in the in the brain, for example. What is it? What is happening inside the head? Which part of the brain is driving gratitude? When does it get overwhelmed by negativity and so on? So that is also another interesting uh, avenue that one could one could pursue uh, in this research. Uh, so those are some some feedbacks that I thought I should share with you. If there are any questions from the audience, thank you, sir. Thank you for your feedback, sir. That there, is, there are a couple of questions. Uh, one question is from Pankaj Karel. As a product owner, I, if I try to collect positive feedback from customers, won't I be missing the necessary suggestions, complaints about improving my product? Yeah, definitely suggestions are more important because that will highlight what the companies are lagging. But companies are focusing more on only on suggestions. That will induces the customer to be more negative. That's what I'm coming to say. So in addition to asking suggestion, the company should also ask for positive feedback. Suppose you can, you can ask only one suggestion, then it, but you can ask two or three positive things about the custom, uh, uh, service render. That will make the customer to feel more grateful and positive. So actually, Pankaj Karel makes a very interesting point, right? Yeah. Part of the reason for asking for improvements is that I would like to be able to improve the service that I'm offering. And as an organization, it also allows me to monitor what is happening. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, your research essentially suggests that if I can, if I can elicit grat gratitude in my customers, that will lead to both affective, positive gratitude as well as hopefully behavioral gratitude later when they come back and buy. Right. So the question that also comes, and again, some some something for you to think about, is as a company, therefore, if I am going to design uh, this feedback mechanism, right? Uh, if I take on board Pankaj Kharel's comment, then the design of the feedback should ask for improvements and it should also ask for positive stuff, right? Now, yeah. therefore, a question that one can ask is, should these be separate, right? Should these be separate that if the person is a regular customer, uh, two weeks, every week, Every alternate week, I will once ask for what I really did good at, and once I will ask for improvement. So that is one way that I could go about asking for feedback. The other way is that every time that I ask for feedback, I ask for improvement, 
and I ask a question which tells me, which asks how, what did I excel at? So both in the same instrument. And then I check whether when I ask together versus when I ask separately, does that lead to a perceptible change in the behavior? You know, to kind of build on Pankaj Kharil's point, does it lead to a perceptible change in the behavior between the two? Uh, because arguably, for me as a company, it is more efficient to ask once. You know, it, it costs money to get the feedback, to, to analyze the feedback, <coughs> and to, uh, to uh, apply the feedback. Okay, let me go to the next question, <laughs> uh, which is from Madhume, Madhume Singh. Uh, customer feedback is an important tool to improve store company strengths and weakness. Do you feel it has limitations that it can be implemented in small stores only? It cannot make changes in big organizations. Um, so let me kind of paraphrase the question a little bit. Um, do you see any difference between smaller and larger stores in terms of the mechanics of collection of feedback and the action on the feedback? So that we, after uh, empirical research only we can say whether it's a, there is there will be a difference or not. But I feel that uh, it will increase the magnitude only will increase. Small store they may have lesser grievances or lesser gratefulness. In bigger store it will be more. And it is as part of the bigger organization or bigger store uh, they have definitely they have to ask because they are running a bigger. Uh, store the investment also high so they should implement this than the smaller store okay. and there will be difference also and the last question that we have is from Jaydeep Soni so essentially he is asking that you know dissatisfied customers or customers who give us <coughs> negative feedback are actually a blessing uh, because if you can address their negative feedback and demonstrate the addressing of that negative feedback, then they will become much more positive. Uh, so the argument therefore, and this is again, it, it throws up an interesting question, uh, is that compared to asking, so let's go back to the earlier suggestion that I had for you. So I'm asking, you know, uh, I'm asking both negative improvement and positive excel in the same one versus i'm asking for uh, these separately right i also try to measure right the people who gave me the negative one i acted on that and once i acted on that then i see the change in their feedback is once there a change? It, yes sir once it is acted on that it should be communicated to the customer and we can make them grateful also. It's an avenue for eliciting gratitude. And, and then the question is, is the level of the gratitude, if I'm building on, on, uh, uh, on, on Jaydeep's question, is the level of the gratitude higher? Of course. Compared yes. to the normal, normal positive one, because I have addressed a negative and turned it to a positive. Yes. Would it be higher? I yes. would also yeah. hypothesize that it will be higher. Yes, it will be, it will be higher. Because the customer feel that they are being taken care of. The company has taken effort to reach them in addressing okay. their grievances. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have a few more minutes. So I will take one more question. Uh, yes, sir. Which is from Patralika Bhattacharya. Uh, so this is about the framing that we were talking about. If positive or negative framing is eliciting similarly biased feedback, how is it possible to design unbiased <coughs> feedback? Uh, is it necessary, do you think, to do this? So, Patralika, the issue of framing positively or negatively is partially addressed in the study because <coughs> we are talking about asking a question, you know, just give us feedback, which is a neutral frame, or tell us how we can improve which is a positive frame for a negative feedback. There, as we discussed earlier, we could add another one which talks about a negative frame for a negative thing. You know, tell us how, where we did not do well. And then 
uh, a positive frame for a positive feedback and a positive a negative frame for a positive feedback. Uh, so those are the ways in which you could kind of design it. Now, what is the purpose of all of this? In this particular study, uh, Bala's attempt essentially is to figure out, you know, which leads to a higher level of gratitude. <coughs> of course, there is a natural next step here that we can take, which is uh, the behavioral part of the gratitude, uh, which I think would be a great next step in the study, uh, especially if you are thinking of sending it to a good journal, uh, that would be a great next step in the study. And, uh, and one of the aspirations, of course, would be to then bring in the neuro part as well to the extent that you think and want, you would like to be able to do it. Okay, uh, we're almost on and ready for the next presentation. So uh, thank you very much, Paula, for a nice presentation. Uh, let me go to the next presenter. Gentlemen, uh, the presentation is on consumer perception of luxury products manufactured by robots versus humans. Ms. Varnika uh, will be presenting on behalf of Mr. Abhishek Sahai. Okay. Uh, so the idea is that uh, you have, uh, this is a comparative study between how consumers perceive luxury products if they are manufactured by robots versus humans. Uh, so go ahead, the floor is yours. So good morning to everyone present here. I am Varnika Hathi and I'm an undergraduate student at Flame University. Uh, my major is psychology and digital marketing, uh, which is why um, the focus is on consumer perception. Uh, so this paper that I'm presenting here today is a work of my final thesis dissertation. And the title is Consumer Perception of Luxury Products Manufactured by Robots versus Humans, a Comparative Study. So to st set the stage for this study, I'd like to introduce and address how technology has taken over manufacturing as a whole and how we all are aware that um, the industries, be it fashion industry or be it automobile industries, they have all experienced a complete move towards automation over the last decade. There's been a 9% annual growth rate observed when it comes to deploying industrial robots over the a whole nation and even worldwide. So advanced robotic integration has been observed in luxury and non-luxury fashion. Um, there has been an increased um, technological boom when it comes to artificial intelligence and robotic automation, and all the industries have been moving towards this arena. So if we look at brands in specific, uh, we can look at one of the most uh, popular international luxury brands, Gucci, which has automated about 30 to 35% of their sneakers by Rangineus, which is their patented robot. So while most brands are moving towards associ getting associated with um, robotic companies and uh, robotic manufacturing um, agencies, a lot of brands have started patenting their own robots that will be uh, moving towards automating their products. Apart from Gucci, which is a luxury international brand, we can also look at domestic non-luxury brands such as Biba Apparels, which is pushing for innovative technologies and robotic process automation in the next coming years. So now moving on to automobiles, um, Ola, which is a well-known brand in India, is in collaboration with AVB Robotics. And um, Ola as well is moving towards automation, especially in their scooter factories. As for luxury brands, um, Tesla, which has been known to be a disruptive agent in the automobile industry, um, Tesla has been moving towards complete automation and has been one of the first to do so um, in the entire factory unit. Um, to increase their robotic production as a whole. So now that we have a fair idea of the different types of brands ha that have been moving towards automation as a whole and how there's been a complete increase in moving towards this direction and the jobs being replaced by humans, we can look at the different studies that have been conducted in this area. So we need to consider that this move towards automation affects people in some sort of way, be it consumers or non-consumers, be it someone who is a regular user of the product or is just familiar with the product by itself. 
So research suggests that people are concerned about their jobs. Humans would like themselves to be replaced by other humans rather than robots, even though that is a competitive force as well. Um, when it comes to robots replacing their jobs, also termed as bot sourcing, uh, there seems to be a higher level of threat involved. Studies are also exploring the perception of consumer-centric robots and how the relationship and perception towards robots and between humans and robots has been ever-changing and is ever-dynamic based on the different types of functions that have been coming into the picture. The relationship between robots' facial dimensions and perceived trustworthiness is another factor at play because how humans perceive the robot depends on a variety of different aspects of the particular ro robot. Investigations on human-robot interaction are focusing on understanding how acceptance, trust, and uh, emotions towards robot is taking place, because usually we associate these emotions with other humans or other entities that we are more familiar with. But when an entity like a robot comes into the picture, there seems to be still an unexploration of how humans are perceiving this. Studies suggest that humans respond favorably to robots with similar or different personalities from themselves. So how exactly is this move towards automation being perceived by consumers? Consumer reaction to electric vehicles has been overwhelmingly positive, and yet it has been disruptive, like in the case of Tesla, as we discussed. Even though electric vehicles and companies are employing robots instead of humans to build their products, there still seems to be a positive correlation between how these automobile products are perceived, even when they are being built by robots. So the question remains, will consumers perceive all products positively even when they are built by robots? What about luxury products as a whole, which are largely manufactured by hand? For example, if a Rolls Royce or Burberry coat is built by a robot rather than a human, will it be perceived similarly on the scale that where, how it's perceived when it's built by a human? So to answer all of those questions, this study essentially focuses on looking at a few models suggested by different papers to understand how humans perceive robotic and handmade products differently. So we can look at the stereotype content model proposed by Acker to begin with. So this model essentially focuses on two dimensions of warmth and competence. When it comes to warmth, we usually associate warmth with qualities like generosity, kindness, honesty, thoughtfulness. And competence is usually associated with intelligence, capability, uh, com competitiveness, and skillfulness. So what this model mainly suggests is that as humans, we judge any entity or an individual or a person or a firm, be it a nonprofit organization or a profit organization, in this case, a brand. So we, have, we make a moral judgment, a blanket judgment about um, each of these different aspects or anything that we come across, be it in our everyday life or when it comes to purchasing a product. So usually um, this kind of a moral judgment is based on these two dimensions. While these dimensions are usually said to be orthogonal in nature, they can also coexist. So what exactly causes this coexistence of these two dimensions? So when it comes to bringing out more endorsement where, about a particular firm or an individual, when more additional cues are provided, there can be a coexistence of these dimensions. There also seems to be a halo effect. For instance, if a person views a firm as being warm, they would also assume that it is competent in nature to be able to associate both these qualities of perception towards that form. So competency usually offers more of a positive judgment for products is what the research has found. Now to look at our brands as intentional agents framework, we look at warmth and competence as two different dimensions again. So here, um, based on uh, Kevin's model, uh, we, we can understand that a troubled brand such as Marlboro, for instance, is low on competence as well as warmth. 
So this matrix essentially looks at how high different products are on warmth, which suggests emotions, good intentions, and capacity to feel, while how they rate on competence, which is cognition and ability to act. So as I mentioned about Marlboro being low on both of these um, aspects, uh, hospitals, for instance, will be high on the warm scale as they are usually perceived to be associated with emotions, good intentions, and capacity to feel. Similarly, a company like Maruti Suzuki might be perceived as high on the competence scale and high on warmth as well by people. But luxury products like Chanel and Mercedes, for instance, are usually uh, perceived to be high on competence, but low on the warmth scale. So to look at this framework parallelly, we have the mind perception model as well, which essentially suggests the similar dimensions of experience and agency. Experience being the to feel and in energy being the cognition and capacity to act. So here, an entity like puppies or a baby will be presented to be higher on the warm scale because they uh, that's the kind of association that most people make with an entity like this. The robot, for instance, is lower on the warm scale and higher on the competence scale. A grown adult, for example, would be associated to be high on the competence scale. And God, as an entity, for instance, is perceived to be very high on competence and low on experience. So now that people perceive robots to be high on competence and low on experience, what does this mean for the perception of a product that is built by a robot? Will it be perceived to drop further on the warm dimension or go higher up on the competence dimension? We predict that it will be going up higher on the competence dimension. What about a product built by hand? Well, the handmade effect here suggests that products attractiveness is based on production mode, which is handmade versus machine made, and that products that are usually made by hand uh, appear to have a lot more love contained inside them when compared to products made by robots. There seems to be a positive correlation between handmade processes and product perception. Significance of manufacturing also depends on the purpose of the purchase. For instance, if someone is to um, purchase a gift for their close relative, they would like to have that purchase be associated with an emotional connect, which is why they would prefer a handmade uh, product or something that they know is uh, produced by hand by another individual, even if they are not aware of who that individual is. There still, still seems to be a higher association with warmth than when the product is not made by hand. It was also found that there is a 17% higher willingness to pay when the products presented are handmade when compared to when they are not. So based on the studies that and the models that we have explored, these are the hypotheses that we have formulated. The first hypothesis is that a luxury product will be perceived higher on both competence and warm dimensions by consumers as compared to people in general or non-consumers. Hypothesis two looks at how a human-made luxury product will be rated higher on warm as compared to a robot-made product. The a proposed a robot made luxury product will be rated low on warm dimension, thereby reducing the willingness to buy. The hypothesis four proposes that providing cues that increase the warm dimension of robot made luxury products will increase the willingness to buy. So, as for the methodology, we propose three experiments and a pretest to test the hypothesis. With the pretest, our aim is to understand the between and within category variations in perception. The experiment one mainly aims to test the perception of luxury products on the competence and warm dimensions by consumers as compared to people in general or non-consumers. The experiment two tests the difference in perception of robot-made versus human-made luxury products. And we also test for the mediating and moderating effect of warmth and competence on the willingness to buy. Lastly, the experiment three tests if providing cues that increase the warm dimension of robot made luxury products will increase the willingness to buy. So as for the pretest, um, as discussed, we will be looking at the between and within category variations in perception. 
So for this, we present a list of 16 luxury brands. After which there are three warmth questions administered, three competence questions, two manipulation check questions, three product involvement and three product knowledge questions. So the expected results are that we expect to see a between category variation and interaction with product involvement and product knowledge. So this is how we have categorized the luxury brand fashion, automobile, jewelry, and watches. And these are the different brands under each category. We have a list of four brands under each category, which makes it 16 brands in total. So the experiment one, your the aim is to understand perception of human made versus robot made luxury products by consumers as compared to people in general on the competence and warmth dimension. So for this, at first, the description of manufacturing process is presented for a particular brand. Three warmth questions are then administered for that brand. And then three competence questions are administered for the same brand. So here is an example. Gucci, for instance, will have um, this particular brief be presented to the, the participant. And Cartier, which is a jewelry brand, will have this brief presented. So the main difference here is that Gucci as a brand has a lot of robotic involvement when it comes to producing sneakers, which is why the brief states the same. And Cartier has highly skilled artisans and craftsmen who work on the necklaces and the different jewelry products. So both the briefs are formatted in a similar way to avoid any unaccounted factors. And they mainly focus on how, who makes the product and how long it takes for the product to be built and how many products are produced by the end of the uh, production process. So as for the experiment two here, we'd like to understand the willingness to buy luxury or non-luxury products when manufactured by robots as compared to humans. So for this, we have employed a two into two design type where there are, there are two manufacturer types, robot versus humans and two product types, luxury versus non-luxury product. The descriptions for robot and human processes will be provided for both types of products, luxury and non-luxury. Questions related to willingness to buy are then administered. So here's a reference. For example, if we take Gucci as a luxury product and Biba as a non-luxury product, and we look at robot and human-made processes in both these aspects. So here we understand that from robotic-made processes, um, how long it takes for the robot to build the eff efficiency, how long they are chained for, what are the kind of different um, source, sources and different materials used in the manufacturing process and how much of a volume is produced by the end of it. Similarly, for the human made part, we look at how long a human takes to um, build their training aspect and how are they, what are the different materials they use and how many products are finally put out when the manufacturing process ends. If you look at the non-luxury side, it's a similar format, but here we have essentially changed the number of clothes that are produced. For instance, for Biba, we look at the number of clothes. So a non-luxury product essentially puts out a mass, a bigger mass of volume of products than compared to luxury products. And as for the human bit, it's similar, but with the involvement of humans. And even the training part differs from luxury to non-luxury where there's a higher level and more years of experience in training for luxury while there's comparatively a lower one for non-luxury products. So here, the first step will be to provide the description about the product type and the manufacturing process. Next, the question presented will be, how interested are you in that product and how likely are you to buy that product? They'll be administered a seven point scale to uh, answer to this particular question. And after this question, we'll also be asking the participants to rate the product on competence and warm dimension as that is a very important aspect of understanding how these products are perceived. So experiment three, 
Here we understand how differently presented cues affect brand perception and the willingness to buy. And this is a crucial experiment because this also contributes largely towards gaining insights for marketing and advertising for brands and understanding how the cues presented in different advertisements and different marketing strategies affect the perception of the brand or the product. Here we have employed a three into two design type where there are three cues presented and two types of products. So the three cues are the warmth cue, control and competence cue, and the, the different types of product types are robot-made luxury products and human-made luxury products. The descriptions for robot and human processes are presented with three types of cues for each brand. The questions related to willingness to buy and consumer perception are administered once again. So traditional brands marketing strategy is usually highly focused on how skillful their artisans are and how painstakingly the product is created by these artisans. So here, for instance, for the roommate side of Gucci, we have the warmth cue, which mainly focuses on understanding the different types of sources and how the materials are outsourced and who makes these uh, products and who, um, which parties and which stakeholders this brand essentially benefits as a whole. So we can see that, that in the warmth queue because we'd like to focus on the emotional connect. We look at understanding that the um, traditional farms and artists source these materials and the uh, profits that the company makes have, have benefited the earnings of the farmers and the artists. As for the competence part of it, we look at how supply and production chains as a whole have, have outsourced the materials and how this benefits the managers, investors and brand owners to suggest a more of an effective, competitive and skillful uh, pers perspective than that of the warmth queue. And the neutral queue acts as a control. Similarly, with the human made part of it, we look at how the craftsmanship is built over the years and how the artisans carefully make each shoe um, the, we also look at how, how many uh, sneakers or how many products are produced and who this benefits. Similarly, for the competence queue, we look at who this benefits, again, being the managers, investors, and brand owners. So here, the only difference lies about how the robot, how long the robot takes to train versus how long the human takes to train. And that this, the robot made product is essentially manufactured by a more automated system, while the human made one is made by artisans and craftsmen. So with this whole process being taken over by robots, we predict that a change in focus from manufacturing from one to another will be essential to explore. A luxury brand can focus on their design, the overall benefit and who that benefit goes to and market that particular aspect of it. And they can also focus on materials that are involved in processing and how long they have taken to train their sources. And they can also market that aspect. These are the focus parts of the different cues provided here, warmth, neutral, and competence. So to summarize, um, the discussion that we will be having based on the entire study that has been proposed here is that the advancement of technology and AI has brought, brought, brought forth the concerns of job replacements. So our study essentially points towards understanding how the major shift in manufacturing processes from robot to, from human to robot and vice versa is affecting consumer perception specifically on luxury products. Consumer perception of products that are increasingly being manufactured by robots is still unexplored, and that's the bridge that that's the gap that we aim to bridge. This has important implications for understanding the interplay between different factors that influence this behavior towards luxury products made by robots. We predict that consumers will perceive robot-made products as less warm and will be less willing to buy such products. However, this is an important factor that advertising the warmth dimensions of each luxury product can change this kind of perception towards them. Here are the references. And uh, I would, in the end, I would like to thank uh, my thesis advisor, Dr. Abhishek Sahai, and our collaborator, Dr. Preetha Menon, for their guidance and support throughout this study. 
and um, thank you to the behavioral science and marketing conference and thank you all for being here and your attention and your time open to any questions and feedback go ahead i have one question um so uh, when you were asking about the uh, uh, these questions on warmth and competence so uh, were, were these questions quite counterbalanced in the sense that uh, was like every time warmth you was coming prior to competence or was it equally balanced right um so we had a mix of warmth and competence questions as well as some neutral questions involved so we would ask questions like how kind do you think this brand is or how uh, which is a warmth question versus how uh, effective or how skillful do you think this brand is which is a competence question and something like how bold do you think this brand is which is a neutral question so we'd have an interchange of all of these questions and they were equally divided to avoid any kind of effect on the answers uh, so vanika sorry to but but in uh, perhaps i missed it but you did not mention the data that you collected um the sample size the results and so on or is it a stage you are at a stage where you've just designed the experiments and now you're going to start collecting the data okay um so basically right now uh, that's why we had mentioned the expected outcome because we are at a stage where uh, we were waiting on the approval of the irb while we were designing this experiment so we have, don't have any data collected as of now but we will be moving towards that direction in the next few weeks okay okay so let me start off my comments by uh, sure. saying i think this is a very very interesting uh, topic to explore uh, absolutely it will be fascinating to see the results that you come up with and uh, also congratulations on you know having a fairly strong sense of how to design experiments so very nice um let me now start off by making some observations on uh in the spirit of how you can improve this further because i think you have the foundation now to take this to a fairly to some interesting and uh, quality uh, outlet uh so that spirit first of all i would kind of like to understand from you what is your definition of a luxury product as you are explaining it to the respondent or as you intend to explain it to the respondent so for a typical respondent a college student or a middle class manager a gucci might be a luxury product a burberry might be a luxury product but if your respondent is someone different a gucci might be an everyday everyday product so i want to understand your operationalization of what is a luxury product second observation is that in experiment 1 um you are controlling for product involvement and product knowledge uh but you are also showing 16 luxury brands but i did not see any uh, anything and again i may have missed it um i did not see anything about a control variable on brand attitude because if i already have an existing uh, if i already have an existing attitude towards the brand that is being shown to me then my evaluation on whether i perceive it to be high on a particular dimension as compared to the general population might be different um because i have a particular either positive or neutral or negative attitude towards the brand so that is the second observation that i have for you in the design of uh in the design of experiment 1 the uh second experiment that you have is a 2 by 2 where you say the the cells are robot versus human and luxury versus non luxury um and then the dependent variable over there presumably is the uh is the uh, attitude or intention to buy 
so here again, it would be interesting to see the operationalization because the queues that I saw uh, are all written statements. Uh, you have these small snippets where you describe this is how it is manufactured, this is positive or negative. She's still there, or I think it's frozen over there. Uh, so therefore, uh, would like to understand uh, understand that. And uh, the last one that you have. Uh, on three by two design, warmth, competence, and control. Uh, again, very, very nice and interesting. I think I would love to see the results. Um, so I guess my main comment actually would be is that I hope that you have set up the, the right control variables um, because it is, I think otherwise the question itself is a very interesting question. The experiment design is, Seems to be reasonably robust, but the but having the right control variables will make a difference between uh, this being a good, solid, robust study and a not so robust study. So those are my principal comments. We do have one question. I hope you were able to hear my questions, uh, Vanika, because I think you dropped off for a minute. Yeah, uh, just like the last bit. I. I disconnect, got disconnected, but I got the sense of um, the observations that you suggested. Yeah. Main observation essentially is I hope that you're able to have the right control variables. Because otherwise, mostly I think the design is, is a good solid design. The definition of what a luxury brand is, that should be interesting, should be there and uh, capturing the brand attitude, which is one control variable that occurred to me instantly. I'm sure there are others uh, that you may have, but may, uh, in your study design, but you haven't mentioned explicitly because that will make the difference between creating the everything else equal condition, you know, caveat empty, uh, sorry, uh, ceteris paribus versus not. So that's the main observation that I have for you. There's one question from uh, one of the listeners, Akshay Ayer. <clears throat> so uh, wouldn't the notion of competence be dependent on the product category for products that require high precision and reliability, you know, luxury watches, for example, yeah. uh, machine made products may be perceived to be more competent naturally. And so is there a product category effect also that you may not be controlling for would be one, one question that one can ask. And is it possible that the reason for preference of human made products are more driven by the notion of exclusivity? and machine made may be perceived to be mass produced and therefore reducing the luxury appeal. Two questions for you. Okay. Sure. So firstly, thank you, ma'am and sir, for your observations and suggestions. And um, as for the question presented here, uh, that's, so the first part of it, um, I can answer in a way that that's essentially why we are looking to understand the within and between category um, differences in the um, perception of these brands. So of course, while um, a product like a car would require higher precision and reliability uh, when compared to a handbag, for instance, and maybe some consumers would prefer cars to be um, made by robots versus a handbag or a jewelry piece to be made by an artisan. So that is mainly the kind of difference that we'd like to study here, whether the perception of a more of a positive association towards competence or warmth is different from one product to another. And the second half of it, well, when it comes to the human made products and the exclusivity aspect of it, um, but now since all a lot of industries are moving towards automation and robotic integration, even the ones that started out as solely um, handmade and artisanal based um, product manufacturing processes, they have also incorporated the uh, robotic aspect of it. And um, of course, that's the manufacturing process brief that we have mentioned, which suggests that- um, sorry, uh, sorry, to in, sorry to interrupt, Monica. I think the question is slightly different. Uh, if I've understood sure. Akshay uh, correctly, Essentially, in your design of the experiment, you have these 16 different categories, right? Now, typically in an experimental design, if you have a three by two and 
or a mm-hmm. two by two. If you are in each cell, if you are showing sixteen different products, uh, then mm-hmm. what Akshay is arguing is that there may be a confound uh, because the results from the cell are not going to be robust because a watch is going to be perceived quite differently as compared to let's say a handbag uh, because for the watch the dimension of competence uh, uh, sorry reliability because a watch requires high precision and re- reliability automatically even a luxury watch would score high on competence versus a bag and so mm-hmm. therefore i am conflating i am confounding the effect over there by having 16 categories within one set right that is the answer that's it okay yeah so that that does make a lot of sense and i think in the first two experiments we are administering all the different brands in each of the categories to understand um that difference in perception but in the last part where the experiment 3 where we provide informational cues we only administer certain um aspects and certain brands to different participants so to so avoid one, way, one one work round for this uh, vanika is to do a pre test where right. you are able to categorize the different products into equivalent categories mm-hmm. and so across the 16 brands perhaps there are three categories and that allows me then to run the experiment as it is right uh, where the cell has and then of course i will still need a larger sample than earlier because in each cell i can only have one category of luxury product okay yeah so sure. let me go to the second question that actually has to you uh, is it possible that the preference for human made products are more driven by the notion of exclusivity that it's simply the fact that there is an automatic perception that machine made products are you know generally mass produced so the effect that you are seeing is actually coming from here this perception that's already here right so um this definitely is a crucial aspect to look at where most consumers believe that Uh, which as the handmade effect also suggests that a product made by hand would be perceived to be a lot more exclusive and made especially for the consumer than a product that is made for a hundred other people a thousand other people or a mass yes. big big larger population so that's why in yeah. the brief that we have mentioned um we looked at controlling this by mentioning that the um handmade products or of course that there, there is a at the end of it the last line suggests how many products are produced by hand and how many are produced by the robots so this clearly states that the handmade products are for instance of uh, 20 uh, products are made a month versus as for the robotic one uh, that of the uh, 50 or 60 uh, products are produced so this definitely um reduces the luxury appeal in some way but then again this is a part of the manufacturing so, process that the brands employ uh, so actually i would argue to you vanika that that uh, again would probably need some thinking in terms of the design because if in your manipulation you are saying by definition but in the manipulation manipulation itself yeah. that you are saying that the handmade is 20 and the machine made is 60 then mm. the person automatically if they have a prior over there they might think differently right mm-hmm. um uh, if i may suggest to you that you can have actually a control variable again right okay. and in your manipulation in the design itself um uh, you should not mention this at all that handmade is so much and machine made is so much but you have Uh, a question or a two or three questions which measures the attitude of respondent uh, towards handmade and towards machine made okay uh, so i capture that variable separately and it also becomes a control variable and that allows me then to focus on the variable of interest which is robot versus human and the impact on willingness willingness to buy or the perception so i'm able to capture that variable the variation in that variable in the design 
right? So it, it's not part of the manipulation, it's a control variable. Okay, sure. Yep. Yeah, I'll definitely incorporate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so if there are no more questions, I think we can say a huge thank you to uh, Banika and her co-authors for a very nice experiment design. I wish you all the best with the data collection. Thank and you. hope that you are able to incorporate some of the feedback that you have had from the questions and from me. And yes. you know, please feel free to reach out to us here at CBS in case we can help in any way uh, to carry this further. Uh, so thank you very sure. much, uh, Vanika. Our next speaker is Ravina Gupta Kapoor, who is going to talk to us about what do you vote for in the case of neuromarketing in Bengal election 2021. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'll just share my screen. One second. <clears throat> what happened? I think she's dropped. Can you hear me? Um, you are kind of is this visible. Am I audible? Your screen is visible, but you are not. We, I think we have a problem at this end. No, we are okay at this end. Am I audible? Uh, yes, you are, Ravina, but we can't see you. We can see your screen. Am I audible? Uh, can you hear us, Ravina? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. But we can't see you yet. One second. I don't know just what happened right now. I'll just log out and log in again once. Okay. It's important to get all those control variables. Yeah. 
चल रहा है प्रेजेंटेशन और मीटिंग जॉइन so we can we could see you ravina and hear you uh, you now just need to share your screen that's all without your video you can share your ppt and begin because we are audible that will work oops okay i guess we'll wait for another 2 minutes we'll just be back in a minute we can see your screen and we can see your slide ravina if you can just put it in slide show mode and proceed i think we need to do what's not right you just need to go point your cursor at the bottom of your yeah that's what i'm uh, just screen and go to the slide show mode is it fine yes perfect thank god uh, so sorry for this technical glitch i uh, was trying to work on both the laptops but then still you know then it has to happen okay. as per the morphis law it has it happens not okay. an issue at all thank you so much and uh, i am ravina gupta i am a phd research scholar at faculty of management studies university of delhi under the mentorship of uh, professor harsh varma today i'm going to present on what do you vote for a case of uh, neuro marketing in bengal elections 2021 so a small disclaimer before i take you uh, to my work is that you know i have uh, tried to show uh, the studies completely based on the findings and uh, i'm not promoting any uh, candidate or any party it is completely a political in nature so um, just starting off that you know as you know the deepest understanding of multiple domains and disciplines go i today i will be trying to connect the dots in respect uh, to neuroscience um uh, one second yeah let's go neuroscience politics and marketing so a lot of uh, you know across the group globe uh, neuroscientists political political scientists uh, psychologists economic uh, scientists behavioral economists people all are working to understand what are the unconscious factors which you know goes into the brain of a voter you know what actually drives their sentiments their choices uh, and ultimately their uh, you know decision making of whom to vote for and whom not to vote for 
So if I'll ask any of you that, you know, how do you decide to vote for a particular candidate or a particular uh, party? So you would give me a, you know, a list of uh, factors maybe which can, you know, uh, include uh, employment, economic growth, industrial growth, uh, the background of the participant and uh, the performance of the party. So it will be a well thought about list, uh, cognitively decided on. But uh, most surprisingly, the literature says that our political opinions are very much skewed. We believe uh, in, uh, we behave much more like tribe members. We behave like uh, people who are, you know, a group, we tend to group think a lot. We uh, tell, we follow heuristics processing when deciding onto the votes. Like Wolfer and Logren in 2020 said that voters are generally irrational while making choices. Dell and Strauss says that voters are subjected to very limited attention. So when we try to deep dive, dive in the literature, that why is it that you know it is such an important fundamental right for any citizen to vote for? Why they take it to you know they tend to behave irrationally or with limited attention? So we got majorly three reasons. One, of course, the outcome is uncertain. And the cost of obtaining the information, the genuine uh, information on uh, basis of which you want to decide is very much higher as compared to the expected benefit. And as uh, our Sir Adan Sir has rightly quoted in his presentation that there is, our brain is wired in such a way that we tend to uh, behave and work uh, in the least effort basis. You know, the brain always tries to con uh, conserve the energy. So we try to always, you know, get influenced by a person who's a uh, in, very influential person in a family or in friend circle or in society. So that's why we behave like tribes or, you know, we tend to group think a lot. I'll take you forward with some very interesting examples in literature. So if you will see in this, a very elegant lady uh, standing on the dais is shown, showcased as in trouble, whereas a gentleman just standing next to her, standing tall. Just try to guess what, what can be the reason. So as for the literature and a study uh, done by the Murray and Smith in 2011, they said the taller presidential elect uh, candidate has won 58% of times. And, and this has been the data from 1789 to 2008. So the height advantage is no more absolute, but still, you know, it can be coincidence. It may, cannot be, maybe. The second very interesting study done by Antonsky and uh, Douglas, they showed uh, this image to children. They said that predicting the outcome of elections is the child's play. So they showed this image to uh, children in Switzerland, and by the way, these are uh, this is the image of you know 2002 uh, presidential election candidates who uh, were nominated and you know contesting against each other. So the, the children in uh, Switzerland were told that please choose your captain of your boat in which you want to uh, you know be sailing along. So uh, very rightly, as we all would have chosen, the gen gentleman on the right, uh, to, uh, the children chose. And the experiment was repeated with adults also. The 77% of children chose Lauren uh, Lor uh, Hinnart, and 67% of adults also chose him. And of course, he won the elections too. So, of course, we are, the children and the adults were completely unbiased towards these two gentlemen. So, it has an influence, the facial expressions and the smile maybe and the way the hairs are kept. So, they all have a little bit of influence on us. So, I'll just show you some of the pictures here. I would request all of you not to uh, get carried away by your emotions of, you know, we all have strong emotions when, when it comes to politics. We have our strong, um, you know, opinions about it. And just focus on the non-verbal part of it, that how do they conduct themselves, what are the hand movements, and uh, how are they, you know, uh, conducting themselves on the stage. So, here you can see, you know, uh, the how the hand movements are they are always clawed the facial expression it's a little bit in agony or you know somewhat stressed whereas if in case uh, you, you will see here 
there is too much, you know, so much calm, calmness on the face. The hands are open-ended, you know, the palms are open and the gestures or the hand movements are very strong. The distance between hand, mic, and then there are so many non-verbal uh, cues they have tried to put in. There's logo on the dyers, then there is a scarf, the dress, the beard. All of this intrigued me to, you know, conduct my study here. When I try to deep dive in the literature, uh, I try to search uh, in order to relate leadership with physical stature. So, uh, you know, there has been a lot of evidence that yes, there is a correlation between physical stature and leadership. From evolution times, Homo sapiens, they all are living, you know, in hunter-gatherer society. And um, when you are in a tribe or, you know, you want to uh, nominate your leader or you look up to the person who has a good physical stature, who has a heavy voice tone because you feel secure, you have a lot of trust in them. So a lot of studies have, have confirmed that. And now as far uh, as non-verbal attributes with leadership uh, relationship is also there in which they confirms that they, uh, you know, they perceive or they alters or influences the opinion of the leadership. When I try to deep dive in uh, per se of politics, uh, Cohen in 2003 said that, you know, people, its political views are uh, influenced, they are affected by the special cues, whether it is the facial shape, facial uh, competence, or their appearance-based politics, maybe sex type uh, uh, cues. So all these have uh, influence have been established in literature. So uh, relationship between leadership and stature has been established leadership and uh, non-verbal attributes have been correlated. Politics and non-verbal attributes have been studied. But this, this brought me to the, my research question that do non-verbal non behavior cues, uh, non-verbal cues if, uh, influence the voting intention? So uh, I did a extant literature in which, you know, they, uh, what all physical traits have been studied with respect to what kind of political element has been taken into the uh, taken into account i will just uh, like to briefly tell about few of them uh, stan and etel in 2009 uh, related testosterone level which is of course a neurotransmitter with the voting behavior of uh, the male candidates male uh, male people as well so the Whenever uh, they tried to uh, do the fMRI studies, or they uh, found that there is a testosterone changes in testosterone level of male voters when their preferred candidate loses election. So there, it is a personal loss to them. It is that kind of a feeling to them. Uh, Armstrong in two thousand and ten uh, related face competency rating. So what he did was that he used two thousand and eight uh, U.S. presidential election candidates, and he showed those. Uh, pictures to people in Australia and New Zealand and told them to read as just on the basis of the face that how would how, what is your perception that you know each of these pers person would uh, perform any task to their you know good competency level they will be able to perform the task better so uh, this was related to the outcome of real elections in uh, US and it was very much in sync. So uh, the snap judgment of the facial competency by unbiased voter was in sync with the outcome of the real elections. So uh, despite that, you know, there has been a lot of uh, research with the law physical traits, but no specific non-verbal cues of political leaders is, has been partially studied. Albert and Brehm in 2003 said that, you know, voting voters' decision-making can be studied by uh, cognitive neuroscience tools or techniques or the study. So it will be a good idea to study on from that aspect. So politics is no more a game of democracy. We know, we all know that, you know, uh, it's like lifeblood of all democracies and a huge amount of money, huge amount of budget is involved in it. And uh, uh, we all know how, you know, it works. So uh, Western in 2007 said that it is electoral success is basically about lighting up your emotional brain. That is the limbic system. So if in case a candidate or party is not able to, you know, uh, reciprocate their thoughts and instigate or trigger the voters' emotions 
they will not be able to you know, nudge the voters in a desired manner and will get the electoral success. So uh, I would uh, be taking, so uh, basically there are N number of neuromarketing industries in the world now. It's been like two decades when, you know, this uh, field of uh, discipline has come into play. So I was just wondering that, you know, there would be people across the globe that uh, they would be using neuromarketing companies to, you know, employ them to, you know, uh, optimize or, you know, trigger the voters' emotions or um, their speech to make the speech better, messaging better. So how the uh, new marketing companies have been employed by political parties in, for their own uh, you know, benefits. So believe me, the list was endless. I'm just putting very small uh, list here. Um, like, you know, the companies Neuro Insights, Sparks, Neuro, Neuro, there are n number of companies and n number of elections uh, they have been used. I will uh, just give you a brief about them that uh, in 2005, uh, US and Mexico, uh, for this election, Spark Neuro was employed by PRI party to pick up their best candidate. And not only that, but uh, in order to uh, study the effectiveness of their policies or if the program or the messages we're trying, which they're trying to reach to the voters. In 2000 USA, uh, Donald Trump uh, elections and we, I'm sure that we all, all are aware about this fiasco of uh, Don, Donald Trump and Cambridge Analytics, where uh, they did the psychographic marketing uh, in which data from 87 million Facebook users were gathered without their explicit con uh, consent to target them, to trigger them as per their own personality traits on the ocean score. So they uh, customized each message of Donald Trump and pushed it on the Facebook page of these users. So that level of target, targeted uh, messaging was done for Donald Trump. And uh, very interesting in the use where in 2017, South Korea, uh, I guess Mr. Lee Buck, yes, he used all factory branding uh, before his, uh, you know, elections, during his election. So whenever he used to address uh, any public, whenever he used to appear for any public gathering, uh, they developed a specific and special perfume named as uh, Great Korea perfume, which represented hope, victory, and passion to trigger voters' memories and attention. So whenever you used to go out in public and address the public, steam used to spray that perfume all over. So, you know, people have that familiarity, that attention, that memory that, okay, you know, Mr. Lee Buck is somewhere around or, you know, he, some association is being derived. Not only on the public gatherings, but on the day of elections, he, his team sprayed the same perfume uh, on the polling booth. And believe me, all these are, uh, you know, of course, following the law because they are outside any law domain and they're trying to influence the voters, manipulate them and trigger their emotions and attentions. So my objective of my study is to analyze the attention intensity, emotional engagement that a political leader generates among voters, and the influence of non-verbal cues on voting intentions. I've used the dual system uh, approach theory given by Daniel Kahneman, where he suggests that you know, our system, our, our brain is divided into two systems, system one and system two, system one, which is fast, implicit, and uh, uh, in, it can be activated using emotions, and so whereas system two, which is explicit, cognitive, and a lot of anal analysis and logical arguments are driven by our system two. So the data and methods which I have used, I've used, uh, try to do three set of experiments in which uh, the first one is the eye tracking. I've used an online platform uh, predict to capture the uh, capture and identify the regions of interest, areas of interest, uh, in particular to the non-verbal cues of political leaders while they're delivering the speeches. The second was uh, in order to gauge at the cognitive level that how do uh, people gauges, uh, you know, gauge their voters' attention by converting into the willingness to vote. And the third was, uh, uh, sorry, and nine static images were used for uh, carrying out the survey. 
And the third study was the sentiment analysis where it, uh, you know, it, the complete sentiments were captured of the Indian citizens for the period of the Bengal elections of two months and uh, various hashtags and various keywords were used for the, the complete duration of the Bengal elections. Of course, this was done by user un, using unified customer experience platform. So what we did was we, uh, you know, did deep dive in literature to find non-verbal cues and elections. Uh, we did eye tracking to, uh, you know, capture the attention intensity with the use of AOIs and heat maps. Uh, then we did the survey uh, for capturing the willingness to vote, and uh, we did emotional uh, to capture the emotion aspect. We did the sentiment analysis. This was my conceptual model in which we are uh, trying to use, we have used two political leaders and we have used the non-verbal cues as stimuli like facial hair, clothing, body cues to uh, the system one and system two and how they influence and they have an effect on willingness to vote. So the first uh, image, first study was an eye tracking study in which the pictures uh, are taken from the recent Bengal elections while they were delivering the speech. So uh, we can see for both the leaders, uh, you know, specifically I'll to start with, you know, we can say that in, uh, for uh, Rahul Gandhi, the tension is only being attracted to the face, the somatoscopic uh, features of, uh, of Rahul Gandhi. Whereas in the case of Narendra Modi, the tension is not only grabbed by the face, but by the beard, by the scarf, by the hand, by the logo on the dial. So he's creating multiple AOIs. He's, uh, cognitively deciding on creating multiple AOIs and uh, that's the very good part that of course the you know uh, ROIs are also being captured people are looking into uh, that aspect and they are uh, putting their attention to that aspect also the cognitive demand was uh, low for Narendra Modi which is highly desirable that means people have to process put less effort in processing the message given by Narendra Modi as compared to Rahul Gandhi. Uh, so we tried to calculate the AOIs with respect to uh, each stimuli maybe the hand movements the beard uh, the clothing and the logo on the dais and compared uh, to compared between the po both the political leaders, which was uh, too high in case of Narendra Modi as compared to Rahul Gandhi. His hand movements, uh, you know, attention intensity was 29% as compared to 15% of Rahul Gandhi. Clothing was 45% as compared to 23% of Rahul Gandhi. Logo on dais was 21% and there was no, uh, you know, attempt of capturing the attention of users on the dais for in case of Rahul Gandhi. The facial hair, I, I said that it was 32%. So it, we can say that it, you know, it can be an intentional move to capture the attention that, you know, okay, during lockdown, if in case you have a beard, uh, it is more relatable. A very interesting finding which we got um, is that we discovered that there is a good uh, relation between hand, mic, and the face distance. So when we uh, see these images, uh, in per, uh, relating to Narendra Modi and Rahul Gandhi, we can see that, you know, the if in case it's considered as a triad, the triad is very really small in, uh, for Rahul Gandhi as compared to Narendra Modi. So this gives multiple areas of interest for the, uh, for the voters. Whereas whenever you, your hands are very much in your proximity of your face or your uh, mic, then doesn't give that kind of you know uh, trust factor uh, to the voters. So this can be a non-verbal cue which might influence voters. So these images were used in uh, our study too, but of course without these triangles to conduct uh, the questions. So uh, these nine plus nine uh, images were shown randomly to the um, voters and you know uh, their intention to vote was decided on we asked the questions open ended questions like whom do would you prefer and why would you prefer what was so special about uh, the person that you know you are preferring him as compared to Rahul Gandhi and the questionnaire was in a 10 point 10 point scale and it was an adapt uh, adopted uh, questionnaire from Everett et al uh, for willingness to vote into, uh, which was used in 2016 
Study three was a sentiment analysis study in which we carried out multilingual posts across the social media platforms and did uh, their analysis on the basis of the sentiments of, uh, you know, behind that post. And uh, maybe it can be negative, it can be positive, it can be neutral. Various uh, keywords, hashtags were used to, you know, pull out the data across the platforms. So for the study, a total of 20,000 posts were extracted pertaining to the Bengal elections, basically for the two, two months duration. And this was done with the help of, uh, you know, an organization who specializes in uh, social media platform. And they helped us in carrying out our sentiment scores for Rahul Gandhi and Narendra Modi for that duration. So this was the score of positive uh, and negative uh, sentiments and the average sentiment score in, for the, uh, Rahul Gandhi and Narendra Modi for both the months of March and April was uh, seen and there was a vast difference in uh, both uh, capturing both of them. So I would like to say that in my conclusion that our political choices are, you know, uh, influenced by the emotions. We voters cast our vote on based on the emotions. It is about activating the limbic system, voters association, what network of association of feelings, thoughts, and images, and non-verbal cues have uh, a strong influence on the emotions of the voters. And uh, of course, it, if we use these, it can, uh, you know, certainly contribute with great accuracy in predicting the success of a campaign or even the election's outcomes. So, yeah, I've said it all. So the non-verbal aspects like facial hair, clothing, hand distance can have a significant influence on willingness to vote. The limitations are that I've used eye tracking in, uh, in my study. It will be a great idea if in case to validate my findings, I can use EEG or fMRI. Uh, and it will be very much interesting to know uh, the relation if in case we are using male or politician and a female politician. And uh, as my uh, future scope is that, you know, I'm next part and I'm trying to understand the verbal cues as well. And like in the narrative content, the empathy component, and when they're uh, you know delivering the speech, so it'll be good uh, idea to uh, you know analyze the tone, the cadence of you know while they're delivering the speech. So. to review the public opinion and you know uh, parties can utilize it to optimize their uh, campaign, their elections, their speech. And uh, thank you, <laughs> I'm open to questions. Okay, so this was the questionnaire we used, um, the open air question that who would, you know, the images were shown that what makes you vote for him, well, what is so special? So this was a complete open-ended question. So um, thank you, Ravina, for that presentation. Thank uh, you. The topic that you have chosen is of natural interest to everyone, while every individual is probably going to have some opinions and sometimes extreme opinions on both sides, but uh, that's not what we are here for. I just wanted to ask you a few questions, clarificatory questions at, at least, because um, uh, somehow in the presentation, perhaps I missed that, but I was not able to get all that information. So in the eye tracker, for example, uh, I don't think you showed us the heat maps. Uh, I'm sure you would have had the heat maps that you would have generated. Uh, I've, I've shown it. Heat maps, fog maps, and saliency map. Okay. Now, how did you interpret these heat maps? And what, what was the process that you used to go from the heat maps to the conclusions that you drew? Okay, That's so my first question to you, and uh, go ahead if you can take the response, and then I will have a couple of other questions as well. Okay, so uh, the heat map, uh, it has, it's been done. So the red, uh, this is the rainbow color, which you know, uh, you know, gets interpreted. So it for the aggregate, uh, you know, attention which is being captured by the people who have taken the study, it captures the attention, uh, you know, in an aggregate manner that, okay, the red dot shows that, okay, the intensity of attention is too much, where, you know, it is diffusing, so that means, okay, the green part is still taking into attention. If in case you look at the fog map, the white and the blood uh, portion shows that, you know, there is no attention at all. 
whereas in, in even if this is just a form of uh, you know representation of the same thing that in the salience uh, map in which what are the areas where you know uh, voters all people had you know are their attentions are being grabbed by so uh, this is how we interpret the results and if in case we want to understand the e each aspect of you know um, the one second here each aspect of uh, the attention like okay there it, uh, the heat map showed that there was an attention on the beard but then how much attention as compared to uh, rahul gandhi was much more so if in case you draw the aois if you can see the green uh, you know box here so this shows that you know this area grabs 32% of attention and whereas in this uh, it, it, it takes only 10% of attention if in case you see uh, one understands that um, ravina the question is more as to how you go from attention to intention right my attention may be uh, 32% in one part of the person and my attention might be 10% on another part of the person uh, how do i go from there to intention are we is it just a correlation that you are suggesting for us that here is here is the attention uh, relative attention on different parts of the person's face and hands and so on and here is the intention that was expressed in a questionnaire and so one here is the correlation is that what it is yes, or is yes. there something more yes or is yes there completely more to attention Yes, sir. Completely. So, what I am trying to do is that uh, you know, first and foremost, the important element of for any political campaign or for any product campaign also is to just grab the attention. So, are these non-verbal cues grabbing your attention, or maybe you know, it is just uh, nothing at all? So, first uh, instance is that uh, are they capturing the attention? Then are they you know engaging you emotionally? And then of course, can is it actually converting into the uh, willingness to vote or not? So it is in this step I in this cycle I have designed my study. So attention, emotional engagement, and willingness to vote. That's how I try to do my study. In, in study three, for example, you're saying sentiment analysis and hashtags and so on. Again, I may have missed it. Uh, but uh, if you can just share a little more detail on how you went about doing this uh, sentiment analysis, did you just count the number of uh, times a particular tweet was done with a particular hashtag, or uh, and then you kind of summed it all up? Did you do actually word analysis, word map analysis of particular words that were used? And were you able to generate a word map that this is the most frequently word used word, and this is these are the other words which were used in association? So, what exactly did you do over there? So, so if in case I would have used the word, then it would have been a more like a text analysis. I have tried to do the sentiment analysis. So, basically, what people are tweeting about, or maybe they're putting their views on Instagram or Facebook. So, what is the sentiment? You know, the emotion behind that. So. The uh, whatever the uh, their text, they, it was segregated by using these keywords and hashtags in multilingual uh, post word gather across these platforms. So uh, and their uh, text was analyzed on an algorithm given by the company on which they have based their uh, algorithm on the limbic map. So if in case, you know, uh, from one line, you know, they try to gauge the sentiment, whether the sentiment is a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment, whether uh, this line is saying, uh, you know, the sentiment behind writing that line, can, is it a positive or can be happy, can be sad, it can be anger, it can be depressed, it can be, so the complete sentiment was captured in that text. So. Uh, it was based on the limbic map uh, where you know your emotions are captured and then the the platform gives you the count of the positive sentiments and negatives but and the limbic, limbic region of the brain has no language uh, it right. doesn't have any language it just responds to the emotions uh, here one is capturing in the sentiment analysis what has been expressed uh, in a tweet for example so again uh, did you did you count the number of tweets of a particular positive or negative balance with particular words and so then you I, uh, so it was an automated tool so uh, you know uh, the positive counts there negative are many, counts there are many 
Uh, there are many of the tools out there. I'm forgetting the names just now, but there are many tools out there. Some of them will simply count a number of positive to, uh, words, neutral words and negative words and give you a net positive versus negative. And that's your sentiment analysis. <laughs> others, will go in, others will go into the semantic analysis of the words which are used uh, and say to you, okay, this is net positive or net negative. Right. Uh, then there are more advanced tools that will actually look at the short sentences. A tweet is 140 characters after all. So they will actually look at the meaning, the semantics of what has been expressed in the hashtag beyond the hashtag itself, and right. then kind of share with you whether it is positive or negative. Because sometimes what looks to be positive could be a sarcastic comment and can be a right. negative comment. So which tool did you use? So the third uh, and, category, what you have just mentioned, uh, it is basically the algorithm is based on the semantics of it, the limbic map in which, you know, the um, uh, literature has given us the limbic map in which they have categorized our emotions of, you know, limbic uh, system based on, you know, if uh, are you a stimulant uh, based customer a person or a dominance or in, you know, a balanced state and the emotions between these, like, you know, uh, the band, uh, complete bandwagon of stimulants versus balance versus um, the third one, what I forgot. Stimulants, balance, and one more was there. So the map is there and on the basis of that, how the semantics has been captured. So that is why I've used particularly this tool in which they're not just, you know, uh, counting the words and, you know, of course, as you just said that, you know, it can be sarcastic. The, the whole meaning, the whole sentiment needs to be captured. So that is why we have used this tool in our study. Okay. Um... Let me see. I think there are some questions from the audience as well. Uh, a question from J.K. Sharma. What was the sample size in the eye tracking experiment and for the questionnaire? So the sample size uh, for the eye tracking was 18. Uh, and uh, for questionnaire, it was 32. And uh, sentiment analysis were like, like 20,000 posts. 20,000? 20, 20,000. Tweets. Tweets? Instagram post. It, that includes Instagram and Facebook. So we use three platforms. It's Instagram and Facebook. Yes. Okay. Uh, Divya Thakur has a comment, I think. Uh, ocean model for discourse method le machine learning. Yeah. I'm not clear what, whether that's a question or an observation, but if I can ask you to clarify on that, Divya. Uh, then there's a question from Gopichand Balasu. Um, um, I'm not sure it's kind of a question that has an answer because that's not the purpose of this research. It's the purpose of this research is simply to document Gopichand. Your question is how much does it contradict with what people expect to hear or what they like to hear? I mean, this is a speculative question, so one would avoid that. If there is a specific question that you have to do with the research uh, on the approach, the method, the findings, uh, you know, please do ask. Uh, so Patralika has a question which says, from your, and I'm kind of extrapolating a little, little Patralika, um, from the research, and from the data that you've gathered, Ravina, what would be the weightage given by the voter to non-verbal cues? Uh, does your research give any insights on that? See, uh, I would like to say that, you know, these are all unconscious factors. So if in case, you know, someone, uh, if, you know, Patrulika, if I'll just ask you whether can you get influenced by the facial beard or the hand movements, you will feel offended that, you know, I'm intelligent enough. You will feel that, you know, these things doesn't work with me. You know, I work on logic. I work on some data. So, but these are unconscious factors which get, you know, you are getting fluid, you are getting influenced by these. So this is the whole purpose of it. You know, the unconscious factors have the 90% of weightage when we do, you know, any decision is made. But, you know, if in case you state that to the user or to the customer or to the voter in this case, they feel offended. They feel that you are, you do feel that I'm so much so dumb that, you know, I will get influenced by the beard or the logo on the dais. These things doesn't matter. 
so we cannot ask these questions directly but we can measure them by you know understanding their emotions I, or I, their I, attention i agree I, I agree with you ravina but uh, this, this is a very interesting point which has been raised right by patralika ultimately whether it's in the context of voting or whether it's in the context of marketing interventions or whether it's in the context of convincing an investor to uh, put in a particular investment as somebody who wants to design an intervention right one would like to understand what is the proportion that is coming from the unconscious and what is the proportion that is coming from the conscious in terms of the decision making of the customer or the voter or and so on so the question essentially is what kind of an experiment would you design and now i know i'm putting you on a spot over here because this is not something that you have actually done uh, but hopefully to be considered as something to look at further in the future uh, how would you design what kind of an experiment could you design that actually is able to capture that so much of a decision this percentage of the decision came from the conscious and this percentage came from the unconscious so um, it's a trick question <laughs> Uh, that, no, no, it's uh, a question, and um, it's a very serious question. Yes, so that is what uh, you know. All the neuromarketing companies are actually also struggling. That you know, they are trying to use these nudge techniques, in which you know they are trying to um, put okay the stairs first, or maybe the small size of plate first. But then, how can you actually measure it? Whether the uh, you know people are doing it consciously or unconsciously? So, so they just try to. Here. here here is a proposition for you this is a question that i'm also interested in right and if you are interested in this maybe we should explore possibly working together to figure out a way to do it there is nothing out there that actually, that that actually is there right uh so if, if one can make a contribution over there that can go to a very very good journal okay Uh, it is not the subject of your research but because you are looking at one dimension of it which is to understand uh unconscious and how that drives decisions uh, i'm kind of expanding the remit and suggesting to you something if it is of interest uh then yes, you know maybe we should talk further okay if there are no more questions thank you divya for that observation